All right. While some people have made the trip out to the Black Hills to actually see Mount Rushmore, many others have no doubt seen it in movies or just in various things on the internet or in magazines, but you know the four presidents that make up this great monument. You think about Washington and Roosevelt, Jefferson and Lincoln, and they weren't chosen arbitrarily. They're chosen to represent four major things that happened in this country. The founding, the expansion, the preservation, and then the unification of the country, all by these four men and this monument stands to remind us of those great realities. But most often today, you might hear the phrase Mount Rushmore in sort of a slang way where people are talking about their top four anything. An individual might say, give me your Mount Rushmore of NBA basketball teams or of musicians or authors, and it's just the colloquial phrase to say, give me your four top of whatever you're thinking about. Who's on your Mount Rushmore? And I'm persuaded that if you were to ask just about any group of Christians of their Mount Rushmore, faithful Bible characters, he probably wouldn't make the list. Even if you whittled it down and said, give me your Mount Rushmore of faithful men in the Old Testament, or I'll do you one better, give me your faithful Mount Rushmore of faithful men in the book of Genesis, we probably wouldn't mention his name. And a reason why we wouldn't mention his name is no doubt because of the fact that there's so little that's actually said about him. You know, there's just about eight verses in total that we read about the man that we know in the Old Testament as Enoch. He's mentioned in Genesis 5, he's mentioned in Hebrews 11, and then in two or three verses in Jude, depending on how you splice it. His name in Hebrew means dedication, and he was just that. In a chapter, Genesis chapter 5, where God is working out his promise that he made to Adam and Eve, if you eat from this tree, you will most certainly die, Genesis 2 and verse 17. It's impressive to see as you read over and over again in that chapter about people that did die that Enoch didn't. He's special and set apart, and yet we know very little or say very little about him. We know that his father's name was Jared and that he lived on earth about some 365 years. We don't know who he was married to what he did for a living, specifically where he lived or the type of food that he liked to eat. In fact, more people know about his son than they do about him, and that's just simply because his son's name was Methuselah, and he lived some 969 years, as one of my professors likes to say about Methuselah. All we know about him is that he lived 969 years, and he's been dead a long time. (laughs) But Enoch, I'm persuaded if God had a Mount Rushmore without fail, He would be on it, and for good reason. The Bible talks about the fact that his favorite exercise was walking, and his walking partner was God. Tonight, in the brief moments we have together, let's notice what we need to do in our lives so that we can walk with God just like Enoch did. Go ahead and turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 5 for the first one. And that is, if we're going to walk with God like Enoch, we've got to walk with God with endurance. Genesis 5.21 says, And Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah, And Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah for 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. And Enoch walked with God, verse 24, and he was not, for God took him. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God. Notice, underlined in your Bible, first in verse 22, and then again in verse 24, Enoch is noted for walking with God. He walks with God in faithfulness, and he does it in endurance. For 300 years after the birth of Methuselah, in verse 22, but then for 65 years after that, he walks with God again. 365 years, we're told. He walks with God in total throughout all that time. His walk with God was one of endurance. When you read in Scripture about an individual walking with God or where we're commanded to walk with God. It's a scripture short way of saying live in close intimacy with God. It's what's said about Abraham in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 48. It's what Joseph says about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Genesis 48 and verse 15. God tells Abraham, walk before me and be perfect, Genesis 17 and verse 1. It means that these individuals walked in close intimacy and fellowship with God. And if we're going to walk with God like Enoch, we've got to do it in endurance. He did it for some 365 years. He kept putting one foot in front of the other, and God wants us to do the very same thing. You know so many people start the Christian walk and so few finish. In Luke 13 and verse 23, a group comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, will there be few that be saved? Jesus says, strive to enter in through the straight gate, for many will desire to enter and will be unable to do so. Not because God shuts the gate, but because many people don't follow through on their commitment. And what Enoch teaches us is not only how to begin well, but also how to finish well and how to continue in his walk with the Lord. 
We don't know much about him, but we know that no matter what else he did, he had this close and deep fellowship and relationship with God. And God's calling all of us to do the very same thing. Second Thessalonians three and verse 13. Don't grow weary in doing well. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 22, those that endure to the end will be saved. And Enoch is set up as a model, as a type for how this is done. Listen, we've got no reason to believe that he was unfaithful before he had children, but I think it's interesting to know that his fidelity was at its most pristine time in life after he had his children, and perhaps realizing the responsibility that was his further fueled that faithfulness and dedication to God. It says about Enoch that he didn't let the busyness and the responsibilities of life choke out his faithfulness to God. He was 65 years old. He gave birth to Methuselah, and then he starts walking with God for 300 years, has other sons and daughters, Walks with God 365 years in total and just keeps doing that. You remember in Forrest Gump when he went on his run across America. 1170 days and 16 hours Forrest ran. You know, his name has become synonymous with running. You can just yell this out at anybody running down Scottsville anywhere. Run, Forrest, mm -hmm. run. They, the interviewers came up to Forrest before he took off and said, why was he doing this? And he says, I don't know. I just felt like running. And then at the end, after he's amassed this great following, he just stops and turns around and says to the crowd, okay, I'm tired. I guess I'll go home. There's a great deal of difference between Forrest's run and Enoch's walk. I love the way the Bible says this. Enoch walked with God. None of us could run with him. But Enoch never gets tired and just turns around and says, I want to go home. He walks with God consistently and habitually until God finally takes him home. And if we're going to walk with God like he did, we all need to do the same thing. What does that mean? It means in your life and my life, there will be ups and downs, variables we can control and others we can't. But we need to focus on no matter what, we're going to walk with them. It means living in consistency and harmony with God in the weirdness of the teenage years when you're just trying to figure out who you are. It means walking with God in the days of college when you're trying to figure out what career you want to take or what major really is your major. Or if you want to do that at all, forget about that and just make sure no matter what you decide, walk with God. It means in the early days of marriage and child rearing. It means in grief and in matrimony, you walk with God in elderly years. And when your body begins to give way due to human frailty and weakness, it means stop trying to figure out all of the hows and the whys and say, no matter what life throws at me, of this one thing I can be sure. When they write my obituary, they will say he was strive for strive with God the whole way. Micah 6 and verse 8, he's shown you, oh man, what's good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Tyler Statton is right when he says, in the end, boring fidelity is the soil in which love is cultivated. Again, boring fidelity is the soil in which love is cultivated. What he means is just in the boring everyday things of life, it is that which ultimately shapes our hearts. That's true, yes, in our relationship with God, but it's true with one another. It means in your walk with God, don't think you're doing it wrong if it often seems boring, mundane, just continuously ritualistic. Because as we walk with him just day by day, one step after another, our hearts are being shaped to love. I told you, Enoch's favorite exercise was walking, and his walking partner was God, and he encourages us to do the very same thing. Get your spiritual exercise and walk with God, but do it with endurance. Don't worry about counting the steps. Make the steps count. Deuteronomy 13 and verse 4, walk in fellowship with him and please him. Number two, walking with God like Enoch means pleasing God above all else. Cooper read for us Hebrews 11 and verse 5. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken that he shouldn't see death. And he was not found because God took him. And before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch was taken, but before he was taken, Hebrews 11 and verse 5 says he pleased God. Above all else, walking with God like Enoch did means making sure we desire to please him above everybody else in the world. It means that God can be pleased and often is. It means our righteousness does not have to be filthy rags. God can look down on us and be pleased. He was with Enoch. 1 John 3 and verse 22 says we know we have whatever petitions we've asked of him because we've obeyed his commandments and done the things that are pleasing in his sight. This word for pleasing God in Hebrews 11 and verse 5, it means to do things in such a way that we have satisfied God's will and have made him happy. Enoch did that and we can do the very same thing. No matter what else you do, no matter who else you please, if you're going to walk with God like Enoch, make it your aim. Make it our life goal 
to ultimately please God. Look at Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Hebrews 11 and 6 says that what Enoch did was special, but he wasn't the only one. He can't be the only one. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those who come to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It's not just Enoch. It has to be true of every one of us. Our chief aim in life is to make God happy and to do the things that will make God smile. And we can do it. It means above all else, we want to live in such a way that God will look down on us and say, I'm pleased. This does not mean that Christians don't care about what other people think. Paul said, I want to provide things honest in the sight of God and all men, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 21. But it does mean this. We want to please God first and foremost above everybody else. And if along the way we can put a smile on other people's faces, we're all for doing that. But if the whole world frowns on us and God smiles on us, then we smile because we ultimately we want to make sure we please him first. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9 says, Where the present are absent, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 4 says, It is our desire to preach the gospel and to please God, which tests our hearts. Enoch shows us how it's done. Enoch shows us that there is a difference between walking by fame and walking by faith. Walking by fame means that everybody knows your name. You read Hebrews 11, and there are a lot more popular people in the biblical narrative that jump off the page, but Enoch's not as well known as the others. Walking by fame means that everybody knows your name, and they think you're special. Walking by faith means you live your life for the one name above all others, and he knows you're special. Enoch walked with God, and he pleased him, and we can do the same thing. Make it your life goal, no matter what else, to make God happy by living the way that he would have you to live and by glorifying him in the way that you do so. Enoch pleased God above all else, and we can do the same thing. In 1937, the Gallup polls started taking these presidential surveys to see how they were doing these presidential satisfaction surveys about halfway into each president's term to see how they were performing and after individuals had voted for them, how they still felt about them. You know presidents are obsessed with this kind of thing and so are their cabinets. How other people see them and how they're revered or how they're despised by the masses and they care about what other people think. There's a sense in which we all do to a certain extent but as Christians we can't be crippled by what everybody else thinks about us. We've got to learn how to live our lives before an audience of one. Enoch did a lot. We don't know a lot of what he did, but we know he did this one thing. He pleased God. And don't miss this in Hebrews 11 and verse 5. It says, before he was taken. What does that mean? Before his time ran out, he got this done. Before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Let it be said of us, no matter what else we leave undone, we don't leave this undone. Before she was taken, before she left, she pleased God. Before he left this world, before he got out of here, he made sure to please God. And we'll walk with God like Enoch if we do that. Here's number three. Enoch warned the ungodly. Jude gives us the only words in the Bible that we actually have from Enoch. In Jude 14 through 16, Enoch tells us that, or Jude tells us that Enoch prophesied. Jude 14 through 16 says Enoch was the seventh from Adam and he prophesied that God comes with 10,000 of his holy ones or his saints and he's going to execute judgment and convict the ungodly of all of their ungodly deeds which they've committed in an ungodly way. What we know about Enoch is he spent his life warning the wicked and Jude tells us that he did. Walking with God like Enoch means we make it our aim to warn other individuals around us about the judgment of God. You know, Enoch lived a couple generations before Noah, and we know how the world was in Noah's day. But what we know about Enoch that we don't learn in Genesis is that Enoch was speaking up and saying something about the wickedness around him, and he was warning people that God's judgment is coming. This is not God's permission toward us to be those individuals that are holier than thou, or we're going to put the world in its place. But it does mean this. If we're going to be God's person, when we see people headed to an eternity separated from God, we make it our aim and our business to say something about it. What does he tell Ezekiel? Ezekiel 3 and verse 17, I've set you up as a watchman to the nations so that you might warn the wicked so that he won't perish in his evil ways. Walking with God like Enoch means warning the ungodly about the judgment to come. You know, Enoch couldn't change everybody that lived around him. He couldn't make them do what was right, but he could make sure that nobody that knew him would stand before God unprepared and not knowing that a judgment day was coming. Romans 14 and verse 12 says, So then every one of us must give account of himself before God. Let it be said of us that nobody we ate with, 
People that have actually stayed in our homes and lived near us, who knew us and we love them, on the day of judgment, they stand before God. They got no clue about what's about to take place. And they nudge us and say, hey, what's all this about? And we say to them, well, we're about to stand before the great I am, the king of kings, Yahweh himself. And they're unprepared. And they look at us and say, you knew this day was coming and you never said a word? You knew this was about to happen? Paul says a part of his role was to warn every man, Colossians 1.28, to preach knowing the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11. And one of the things that Enoch did was he warned the ungodly. I don't know how successful he was, but in the end, that wasn't the point. The point was to sound the alarm for God, and he warned those around him. And if we're going to walk with God like he did, listen, this is not comfortable. It's not pleasant. We would like to be liked by everybody and not make anybody uncomfortable, but we've got to be able to do what he did, and that is warn the ungodly that there is a great day coming. And that God will judge. And here, here's the last one before we transition to Neil's portion. Walking with God like Enoch means that God will take us. The Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. Enoch is in a class all by himself. Only Enoch and Elijah, not even Jesus, escaped this world without dying. 2 Kings 2 and verse 11 and Genesis 5 and verse 24 says Enoch was not and Elijah also was taken that he never saw death. You know, you just start reading through Genesis chapter 5, and it's impressive what you see. Over and over, it almost puts you to sleep when you start reading it. He was 960 years, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and Enoch was not because God took him. And you've got to pause and say, what? Why is that? It's God winking at us through the text and simply saying, this is the way it was always meant to be. Human beings weren't meant to die. You were meant to be with me. And the Bible assures us that if we walk with God like he walked with God, one day we won't be either because God will take us. Jesus says, those that believe in me will never really die. They will live, John 11, 25 and 26. Those who believe in me have passed from death to life, John 5 and verse 24. Enoch walked with God and he was taken. And the same thing can be true about us. It will be if we walk like he walked. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. When you read through Genesis 5, you see 900 years, 800 years, 700 years, and Enoch's years aren't as long as the others. 365 is not a lot compared to 900, but evidently, according to God, a strong life is better than a long life. Enoch lived well. He lived right. And God said, you're too good for this world. He was too good. The world was unworthy of his presence, Hebrews 11 and verse 38. And God says, you can come and be with me. Enoch walked with God, and we need to do the same thing. And the good news is he's not the last. He had a great-grandson who followed in his footsteps, and Neil's going to preach to us about him. When you think about Noah, Noah is obviously one that we know a lot more about. In fact, New Testament writers are often going to speak about Noah and teach us a great many New Testament lessons, lessons that are important to the church and important to the very end of time. In Matthew chapter 24, when Jesus moves away from the destruction of Jerusalem and begins to introduce to us the second coming of Christ, he starts with the example of Noah. He says they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage in the days in which Noah went into the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Right after, Jesus says of that day and that hour knows no man. The Hebrews writer in the very text that Cooper read to us so well a moment ago tells us that what's so relevant about Noah is the faith that he had. And tonight we're talking about walking with God in faith, so we'll come back to this one. Peter's going to write about Noah in both of his letters. In the first letter, he's going to illustrate the patience of God and the importance, that is the necessity, of baptism by using Noah and the very events that we're going to look at tonight. And then in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, he is going to show us the importance of preaching in God's plan by identifying Noah, at least chronologically, as the earliest of all of the preachers that we read about in the Bible. When we think about Noah, we think about the, the statement that is made and that forms this lesson tonight, and we think about how we can walk in faith like Noah. There are a lot of people who are interested in other people. And a lot of times that's for the right reason. But some people are interested in others only in a material sense. And so much so, in fact, that they've come up with a, a proverbial saying, keeping up with the Joneses. I wonder in a spiritual sense, 
Are we keeping up with Noah? Now, if you were to look at Noah, we see that the Bible says that God brought the flood on the world of the ungodly, but saved Noah, a, righteous, a preacher of righteousness, the eighth soul, in bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, there are a lot of great things that we could say about Noah. But people who might look at Noah's life might see a series of failures when they look at him. In looking at Noah, they might say, well, even though he preached, and we might estimate in that about a hundred years of all the work that he did, he was only, even after the completion of the ark with hundreds and thousands of animals, he was only able to save eight souls. When we look at Noah the father, he had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. But one of those sons saw his father's nakedness, and he mocked his father, Genesis chapter 9, verse 21 through 25. Well, we can look at Noah, the preacher, and we find him, as soon as he comes off the ark, he takes to building vineyards. And he goes down into his vineyard, and he makes wine from that, and Noah gets drunk from his own wine, number, uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 and 21. And so people looking in on Noah's life may say Noah was a failure. Noah, the missionary was only able to save seven other people besides himself. Noah, the father, had one of his three sons to mock him and to show great disrespect for him. And Noah, the preacher, got drunk. Can you imagine that being circulated around social media today? But was he a failure? A good question for us to ask is, as we look at living a life, walking with God in faith, is are we keeping up with Noah? And in the event for which we know Noah the best, I want us to focus around that and see three things before we bring this lesson to a close. The first thing that we see with regard to Noah is that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, there is a stunning contrast between the seed of Adam and the, the seed that comes to the time of Noah and Noah himself. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible simply says that Noah found grace or Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and blameless in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Think about what a contrast Noah was to the world all around him. Noah was a just man, imperfect in his times, and he walked with God. But what about the world in which he was living? Then the, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of men's heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he, was, he made man, and he was grieved at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have made, both man and beast, and creeping things and birds of the air, because I am sorry that I made him. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord against that kind of a backdrop, how hard it was to seek and to find the favor when everybody around you was living in such a way. And when we think about the world in which we are living today, I don't know how far from that we have gone. When you think about the violence and the hatred and the immorality that is portrayed for us in real life, in television and in the movies... And through pornography and immorality, we see how men's hearts are focused on those things that are only evil continually. God has you and me here. Are we keeping up with Noah? Are we finding favor in the eyes of the Lord? The world would like us to conform to it. Have we conformed? The Apostle Paul says in that well-known passage in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The world would like to set the tone for us. But God has us here to set the style and the dress and the behavior for the world. 
In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be made salty again? It is therefore good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And neither do men take a lamp and place it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand that it may give light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When I look at Noah, I see a man who was an influencer on this world. In fact, Ezekiel is going to look back on the life of Noah in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, and he is going to place him alongside of Job, the suffering one who endured more loss than anyone, and Daniel, the courageous one. Here's Noah, Job, and Daniel together. These individuals who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You know, as I was reading that and reading in this lesson, I wondered if God placed me along other Bible characters with my traits and my personality, who would my name be next to? I hope my name would not be next to Cain, who hated his brother and was called a murderer because he was. 1 John 3 and verse 12. I would hope that my name doesn't go alongside of Gehazi, do you remember when Elisha refused the gift of Naaman? Gehazi lied and he went and got it. His desire for money was so great that he was willing to make such a risk. Or Judas, who sold out his Savior. Or Demas, whose love for the world was so great that he forsook the Apostle Paul. Or would my name have the dignity and character of Daniel and Job and Noah? Are we keeping up with Noah when it comes to finding favor in the eyes of the Lord? Noah was a man whose character, his dignity, his righteousness was such that he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Are we keeping up with Noah? But second, we see with regard to Noah that Noah was a man who had a very strong faith. It's at the heart of our lesson. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, the Bible says that by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen with godly fear, prepared the ark for the saving of his household and was saved. And through this, he became an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. When we look at Noah, we ask ourselves, are we keeping up with Noah when it comes to his faith? It's remarkable what God asks Noah to believe. There are at least two things to me that we can point out tonight that Noah is asked to believe that would push the limits of anybody's faith. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13, God is saying to Noah that he wants him to preach about this event that's going to take place. Noah is to prepare himself and his family for the coming of the flood. Can you imagine what kind of trust you've got to have in God when you have never seen an event like this locally, much less globally, and God is laying it out there for you to do this? Noah also is told to do the incredible in Genesis 6 and verse 14. He is told to build an ark. I don't know how many of you have ever been to the ark encounter up around Cincinnati. I've heard about the one in uh, the Netherlands, and I had heard about the one for years. And uh, We went last spring, and we saw the ark that's uh, been built there in the Cincinnati area, and we walked through it. And if you've ever been through all three levels of that, and you see how massive this structure is, and without the benefit of anything to give him any reason to believe except that it was the God that he served and that he walked with, that caused Noah to build this project day by day. I remember being a little kid in Bible class and my Bible class teacher asking me to imagine all the people that walked by Noah every day as he's building the ark and what he must have heard, how they must have ridiculed him as he was doing this. The Hebrews writer holds up Noah as an example of faith for us because he was willing to go to such lengths for something that made no earthly sense. You know, we talk about a, a mental ascent being a mere belief without any action in the truth or doctrine that's taught. That's not the kind of faith that Noah had. Noah's entire life was enacted on the faith that he had. But I think about how God has done the same thing for us. And that's exactly how Peter uses this event to tell us about what's yet to come. The flood is thousands of years in our past. But there's another event. And we ask ourselves, are we keeping up with Noah about those things that are yet to come? 
The Bible tells us that the earth is going to be destroyed. As he said in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as the thief of the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The earth and all the works therein shall be burned up. Do we believe it? The Bible tells us that there is coming a judgment as it was in the days of Noah and that we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things in our body. Hebrews 9 and verse 27, it's appointed unto us to die and then the judgment and every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the deeds in our body, whether good or bad. Do we believe it? And the Bible tells us that we're to save ourselves from this crooked generation. Acts chapter 2 and verse 40. Are we doing it? Are we keeping up with Noah when it comes to our faith and what God has said is to come as our faith is put to the test? To walk with God like Noah did is to have a very strong faith that the promises of God to come along with which are the great reward, the salvation that comes in taking him at his word is to have a very strong faith like he had. Are we keeping up with Noah? The third thing we can observe about the faith of Noah is that Noah saved his family. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 7, the Bible says, So Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wife went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. A great many people would say, yes, Noah, you've preached for all of this time and you did not convert anybody outside of your family. But a beautiful truth is that Noah was able to save, so far as is told for us in Scripture, his entire family. Think about how remarkable that is. I have known some wonderful and godly women who have not uh, converted their husbands. Not by any fault of their own, but they've not converted their husbands. Or husbands who have not converted their wives. I've known good and godly preachers and elders who, despite their influence, have had children who have gone into the world or have gone into apostasy. I have known some that are like those that Peter, but Paul rather warns against in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. One who can become a preacher of righteousness and yet turn away from that. The apostle Paul says, I keep under my body and I make it my slave, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Are we keeping up with Noah when it comes to the saving of our family? You know, the wonderful and beautiful truth is that as long as there is time, there is opportunity. We have the ability to reach out and to, to help those in our family that have fallen away. But when we look at Noah, we find an individual who prioritized his family and he helped them to be saved. It's an encouragement to us. When we think about the faith of Noah, we see that it did not persist in his children and his grandchildren. At some point along the line, they were among all of those who did not get on the ark. I think about the apostles and their sons and their daughters. How was their righteousness? How was their faith? It is something that we must try to ensure in the generations that follow. It's a challenge to us to keep up with Noah and the saving of our family. You know, when I think about Noah and his success... It was a very successful life that he lived. But success often comes in small steps and small measures. Sometimes it can seem very small in the eyes of the world. When you look at how God describes the work and the success of Noah, there's a word that's used in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, and it's the word few. He moved and he preached and he acted and yet as God's long suffering was waiting in the days of Noah, there were eight souls, few that were saved while he was preparing the ark, saved by water. You know, when we think about the success that we can have, if we can find favor in the eyes of the Lord, then we're going to find ourselves eternally successful. If we can have the faith that Noah had, we can find a faith that's strong, a faith that saves. And if we can prioritize our family, what a wonderful goal it would be for us as we think about the Great Commission starting in our homes. What if we could retrieve the fallen in our homes from those that make up the Lehman family? What if we could baptize those who are not yet members of the body of Christ here at, at Lehman? What impact would it make in our family's life? What difference would it make in Bowling Green. If we could have the saving faith with regard to our family that Noah did, we'd be keeping up with Noah. 
And to keep up with Noah is to be one who walks in faith with God. But there's no way that we can walk in faith with God if we're not walking with Him. Noah demonstrates to us, in fact, he's used to teach us what God would have us to do in order to be able to walk with Him. You know, the, the, the plan is simple and we often mention it. Believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithfully unto death. That's a lifetime of challenge and growth and walking with God. And if we have stopped walking with God, He tells us how we can come back. He tells us to repent as he told Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8.22 through Peter, repent. And then we confess. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we pray. James chapter 5 verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does much good. When we think about walking with God, we see these two who were separated by just a few generations, but they're two of a few, two, in fact, of whom it is said explicitly that they walked with God. They're a pattern, they're a model for us as we strive to live by faith this year. Living by faith is going to involve a lot of what we do with others, but it begins with us. Maybe you need to take those first steps of faith tonight. Mike is going to lead us in a song of encouragement. If you need to respond to it, why not right now as we stand and sing?